Good day, everyone, and welcome to our online services. You are so welcome here. My name is Marunel, and today Ratif will be continuing with our Be Still series in the Whispers of God. I pray that you enjoy this sermon. Hi there, and uh, it's so great to be with you today again, um, this online sermon. And I trust that you would have such an experience with God's Word and the Spirit of God that that in this moment, even if you're watching this, will be ministering to your soul deeply. Now, we're in the second week of a series called Be Still, and our tagline is, In the Silence, We Find New Life. And last week, uh, Wesley Britt started off by sharing that that God calls us to silence and to solitude so that we can really um, be in his presence and hear his voice. And and the challenge of our society is we're just so busy, busy, busy. Where do we find silence? Where do we clutter out all the noise where it's just the voice of God and our hearts speaking to us? And he also spoke about the places that Jesus, the way of Jesus, where he sought places of solitude, desolated places, the wilderness places where it's just us and him. And then he spoke about the goal of Christianity is not to get to heaven one day. That's the result, yes. But the goal is to become more like him, to become more like Christ, to be um, less of ourselves and more of him. Now, I don't know if you've been around people that you've really liked. And if you have been around them, you want to be around them more. Um, you make plans to hang out with them or to have coffee with them or to go to a movie, play sport with them, because something of who they are is so attractive that it actually rubs off on you. Maybe that person used to be your best friend and then you got married. Now it's your spouse. And now 20 years later, people would say, oh, you start to look like one another or you talk like one another or your mannerisms. And that is what happens when we spend time with people and become more like them. And here is the key, proximity and frequency. Proximity means to be close to somebody or something. And frequency is how regular are you doing that? And so much more with Jesus. If we want to become more like him in this process that the Bible calls sanctification, big word, that simply says less of me and more of him to become more like him. If this is our goal, then we so much more need proximity and frequency with Jesus. Um, and, and, and if I think about that, I think about someone in the Bible that had that with him. It was Moses. Exodus 33 verse 11 says, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Intimacy, relationship, nearness, proximity, frequency. And I believe this is not just for somebody who was so amazing like Moses. I believe this is the birthright. No, no. It is the rebirthright of every born again Christian. If you're watching this and you have given your life to Christ, you've been born again, then this is your birthright. And listen, if you've not yet made that decision in your life, the door is wide open. Jesus paid the price so that you can also meet with him face to face as with Moses. Jesus was the one that that came through his atoning sacrifice on the cross that breached the gap between a holy God and an unholy mankind through his sacrifice on the cross so that we can have proximity and frequency. That's why it's not just for the super saints or the pastors or the prayer warriors. No, you can have this close relationship intimate relationship with Jesus where you spend time with him and his word changes you or you pray and where he actually speaks back and we listen and we respond to him. This is the birthright, the rebirthright of every Christian. But here's the question I want to ask you today. Do you really want believe that God wants us with him? That he wants proximity? That he wants us close to him? Or is he just so appalled by our sin? And second question, do you believe he wants you close to him? 
And do you actually believe that he wants to speak to you intimately, face to face, as with Moses, with a man and his friend? Now, I trust that this, this time together will help answer these questions. I want to break up um, my time with you in three little parts. The one is just to lay a biblical foundation that God actually speaks, and that he wants to speak to you. And secondly, delving into how does he speak to us? How can we become still and then hear the whisper of God for ourselves? And what might be keeping us back from becoming still and hearing his voice? And then lastly, we're going to end with a bit of a, a practical exercise that you and I can do right here today where I trust that God will speak to you personally. Even you're not in this room with me, but he's there. I believe that he wants to speak to you. So let's jump in. I'm going to look into various scriptures. I'm not just going to take one scripture and expose it. Uh, We're going to look at different scriptures um, to help us understand that as we become still, we can hear the whisper of God in the proximity and the frequency that he paid for on the cross. So, you know what's amazing? That God has been speaking from the start. If you go to the book of Genesis, in Genesis 1 verse 3, everything started, everything was created by God speaking. Verse 3 of Genesis 1 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And if you read the rest of the creation story, constantly he said, Something and then something was created. He spoke, his voice carried so much power that with one word, things were created. God was speaking. In verse 26, then God said, again, he spoke, he spoke to himself, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, if that seems a little bit weird or was that a grammar mistake? No, it's not because God is a triune God. So God is God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit. Fully God, but three different persons. And he turned to the relationship he had with himself, three in one. And he said, let us make man in our image. Okay, let us who are in relationship make man in our image so that they can also have a relationship with us and with one another. Another way of saying it is, let us make man to love and receive love absolutely free. That is the place, in my opinion, of true freedom, where you can be loved and love others without anything in the way, with anything keeping us from receiving and giving love. And that is how he made us. But he made us by saying it. And then he formed us from the dust and he's breathed life into us. And then Two verses later, when man, Adam, was created and Eve, he turned to them, blessed them, verse 28, and God said again, he spoke, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. He gave them a command, he spoke to them. And then two chapters later in Genesis 3, we see that there was a serpent, the enemy, who was crafty. And he said to the woman, now listen what he said to her, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, that's not what God said. God said, you can eat from any tree except one. So what did the enemy do? And he still does it today. He brought doubt to what God said. He twisted what God said. And that's why maybe today you're asking, did God really say Or does God speak and does he want to speak to me? And whatever he spoke through the word, can I trust this? Because that is exactly what the enemy did right there. He came to break trust. And any relationship, the foundation is trust and very good communication, what we say. And he came and he brought doubt. And from that day on, doubt crept in. I doubt God's motive. I doubt does he love me. I doubt his voice. And if you doubt all of that, why would you want to be in proximity to him? Why do we want to be in his presence? And that's why what happened, they fled. They hid themselves. But the beautiful thing is 
<laughs> even though they sinned and disobeyed God, God still spoke to them. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves, that's what sin does in there, from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? You see, God still speaks even if we sin and if we, even if we turn our back to him. And maybe God is, has been speaking to you and say, come, come back, come to me. And you are hiding somewhere. You are afraid of his presence. You are afraid of proximity. Never mind frequency. And he says, come, where are you? Now the story continues. Then the rest of the Old Testament, God kept on speaking through the prophets. And then in the New Testament, as Hebrews 1 says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in the last days, he spoke to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So the beautiful thing is now God didn't just speak from afar. He actually came to us incarnate and whatever he spoke and Even his life spoke so much more. His atoning sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. If you want to know what God says, look at the life of Jesus. This is what the scripture says. And then after Jesus rose and ascended to heaven, he poured out his spirit on us. Old Testament, only certain people could hear his voice. But now in the New Testament, because God gave us his spirit to lead us into all the truth, now all of us can hear his voice. Do you believe that God speaks? Well, I believe it. Not just from scripture, but I can tell you in my own life, I've heard the voice of God for over 30 years in various ways. And therefore I can tell you that God is absolutely alive. I'm going to give you one testimony. The other day I was going through a really rough patch I was really struggling with God and I was struggling to hear his voice. I was almost mad at God and I, and I broke down crying. I said, God, just speak to me. Within five minutes, I picked up my phone and I received a message from a teenager in Somerset West who just completed victory training. And she said, Hey, Wim, do you remember me? I used to be in Pretoria 10 years ago. We were asked at victory training to receive a word or to wait on God to give a word to somebody. And I had you on my heart and I just want to give you this word. Friends, it was exactly what I was feeling. Like the image she gave of me in a tornado, tornado being spun around and not sure and what's going on and just crazy and some anxious thoughts. It was exactly what I was feeling. Now, do you know what that did to me? I felt that the God of the universe loved me and cherished the relationship with me so much that he asked a teenage girl to give me a word on the other side of of our country. I felt loved. I felt that God still knows me. He hears my prayers. You see, for me, that's one example of so many. But how does God speak? And what keeps us from hearing his voice? Now, throughout scripture, we, 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 we glean that, that God wants to speak to us, but we live in this fast food society, you know? in this community where, um, even our coffee, we want to grab at a quick McDonald's and there we go. And we want delivery, fast delivery over quality. We go for the chickens, ah, oh, the chickens, the chickens 60 60 or the Uber eats uh, versus the sits and dine around the living room table because we are so accustomed to distractions. We, we rather have efficiency more than intimacy. Um, if you've been in South Africa, you would have probably seen how people herd sheep. <laughs> And we can learn a lot from sheep, how they are herded. Um, in South Africa, you either have a stick or a border collie dog, uh, scarpoint, that would chase them around. If you go to Australia, um, people are on a motorcycle uh, herding the sheep. But even today in modern day Israel, if you go to a town like Bethlehem, and I've been there, you would see there are little flocks of sheep, even in the streets, 
And you're like, what? The cars are going to run them over. And here's a traffic light and here's the herd. But they've got a shepherd that walks in front of them. And as they're walking, he just calmly says something. Da, 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 da. And they stop at the traffic light. And the cars come passing by. And then it will go again. Da, 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 da. And they start walking. Because they know the shepherd's voice. That's what John 10 says. The sheep hears the voice of the shepherd and they follow him. And I believe when we become still, the more we have frequency and proximity in God's presence, we start to discern his voice. We can't discern it. We're all rushed and rush in and rush out. And it's all about um, just, just delivery and efficiency. No, as these sheep, we walk behind the shepherd, we start to hear his voice and discern his voice. And then you also know when it's not him speaking to you. So here's some practical things. How do we hear the voice of God? Now, firstly, God speaks to us through scripture. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that God gives us this word so that we can be equipped for every good work. Um, he speaks to us through scripture. He speaks to us through others who teach the scripture to us. It might be a, a leader, um, a small group leader or a teacher or a pastor at church or even a family member or a friend that uses the source as the Bible or the Bible as the source. They don't just speak their own opinions. God speaks to us through that. He speaks to us through difficult times. <laughs> I just shared a story for, of mine. Sometimes I think God speaks louder in the difficult times because we are so broken, we are so dependent, we need to hear his voice. Then God speaks through the Holy Spirit. And that's the still small voice inside of us. But also it might be visions and dreams or God using people like that teenage lady to give me a prophetic word, a prophecy. A prophecy is basically a word that God gives either an image or a scripture or an impression or a feeling that somebody gives you that is then a word from the Lord. Of course, it needs to be tested. We'll see in a moment's time. But God can use that in our lives, and he does that through the Holy Spirit. God also speaks to us through creation. I'm going to share on that in a moment's time. But as a songwriter, uh, creation being in nature is one of the greatest ways that God speaks to me. Think of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day by day, they pour forth speech. They're speaking of who God is. God speaks to us through his creation. And then number six, God speaks through whatever and whomever he chooses, but never in disagreement or contradiction with the Bible. He can even use a donkey as he did in the Bible in Billiam's story. He can use your enemy. He can use a child, but he will never, ever contradict the word of God. Remember that. And then lastly, I believe that God speaks to us through the confirmation of community, of spiritual community, of spiritual family. Sometimes when I'm stuck and I'm not sure, am I hearing God right? I would go to the elders or to friends and just bounce the word and leaders and say, I'm sensing God is saying this. Would you just pray with me and just confirm? And if they have peace and I have peace, then I know God is speaking to me. So here's the question then. If God wants to speak to us, can I give us something today um, that kind of um, almost like an image um, that draws you in now and draws me in to actually seek his presence, to become still so that we can hear the whispers of God in our lives. And this is something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. We were on holiday and we were in the law felt or the low felt and we had a little um, a bungalow. Where we literally stayed on the Sabi River banks. And the moment me and Isabella and my wife and our three kids, we, we walked into this, this little bungalow and we looked on the stoop. The river was right in front of us and we had a very busy quarter. And the moment we stepped into that space, we heard the rushing waters, the calming effect. Something started to wash over my soul. This peace this peace that came over me. And that whole week we were there, it ministered to my soul. Now, I started to, 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 to delve into the scriptures, came across actually this sermon's 
title verse or, or the series title verse in Psalm 46, Be Still and Know That I Am God. Um, if you go a little bit earlier in that scripture, Psalm 46 verse 4, it says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. And I started to, to read about rivers in the Bible and the effect. And, and Bible scholars or Bible writers uses river imagery to convey God's life-giving presence. We'll read things like, he makes a river in a desert. Um, and it's a, it's a metaphor that people all across the world knows about because there's rivers everywhere. Life-giving river. And that image, I want to leave with us today as an image that equals the presence, the proximity of God. And the invitation for me and you to come and drink from this river, to come and play in this river, to come and bathe in this river, this river that makes glad the city of God. Now, maybe you are feeling like you are in the desert, desert of hearing God's voice and you, you can't discern his voice and and there's, there's literally, I see this picture as I prepared for this, for all of us, that there is this river maybe in your desert that God has made a way, but, but, but we don't want to come and drink from the river. And there's things holding us back. Now, this scripture in Psalm 46 actually alludes to, if I would say, my main text for today in Revelations 22, which speaks about this river in the city of God, in the new Jerusalem, this prophetic picture of how it's going to be one day. So read with me. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the land through the middle of the streets of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. <laughs> I want you just to picture this picture or this, or this river in your mind's eye flowing from the throne of God. This river that brings water of life, bright as crystal. And it comes from the throne of God. It comes from God's presence. And it's flowing and on the banks, the tree of life that yields fruit every every season, every month, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. It's this invitation for me and you to come and drink from this river. Now, there's many other places in the Bible where it also speaks about the river of God, but I want to zoom into this, and, and I almost want to metaphorically ask you, are you in the river, or are you standing on the banks? Proximity? And frequency. Maybe you've drank from this river, but it was like two months ago or two years ago. You sat in God's presence, but it's a vivid memory. So you've been there, but you've forgotten how it tastes like. I want to propose four things that might keep us away from this river, from his presence, from proximity. On the one side, we have what we call indifference. Indifference basically asks the question, would it really make a difference in my life if I become still, be in his presence and spend time with him? Maybe, Lord, do I really need to ask you, what is your opinion about this business deal, about this big decision or about this relationship? Would it really make a difference? Because we live in a society where things happen so fast and we go at a pace and we we think like, well, we've, we've actually got this. It doesn't really make a difference. Now, if you've tasted from that river, if you've heard the voice of God in your life, as I have many times, I can tell you it really does make a difference. It brings a peace to your soul. It brings a clarity and a confirmation that changes everything, that helps you stand when the doubt comes because you know that God spoke to you. The other thing is independence. Not just indifference, but independence. And that's that thing where we say, I'm actually doing okay by myself. I've seen this so many times. When I'm in trouble, I run to God. <laughs> but when it's going well, I'm like, hmm, I've got this. I've got this nailed. And that's just basically pride. It's, it's saying, 
actually saying, I can trust myself and I am sovereign. I have the final say. But listen to what John 15 says. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides, that's proximity, that remaining in him, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Now listen to this. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm like, okay, so Lord, so apart from being your presence, living from rest, living from your presence, living from your voice, I can do nothing. Well, according to the world standards, I can do a lot of things. But things that bear fruit, eternal kingdom fruit, the word says I can do nothing. So it's indifference, it's independence, and maybe we need to repent of that today, if that's you. But on the other side of the bank, there are two other reasons. And the one is shame. Think back of the story of Adam and Eve, the moment they sinned, they hid. That is what sin does. Sin makes us hide away from the presence of our holy God. We don't want to jump in this crystal clear river because we know our sin will be exposed. And if it's unrepented sin, then I can tell you again that Jesus made a way. That he wants you in his presence and therefore he made a way so that you can be in his presence. And that is only by the blood of the Lamb. When we repent of our sin, we turn away, we acknowledge our sin, he changes us and he forgives us and he gives us the right to stand in his presence. When Jesus died, the Bible says the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, that was the temple where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And only a certain amount of people once a year could enter that, the holy priests, the high priest, and the rest were separated from God's presence. But the moment that Christ died, his body tore, the veil tore, and the separation was taken away that we can enter in only by his blood. If you have unrepented sin and shame, then the enemy has legal rights on you to keep you outside of his presence. But the moment you bring it into the light, you confess your sin, or especially if it's a habitual sin, you confess it to another Christian brother or sister. You do it in community, then the enemy loses his legal right and you can enter into his presence and you can jump into that river. (laughs) <laughs> and come and enjoy the presence of God that he can speak to you, that his voice can come into your soul. Shame, but also shame, not of just unrepented sin, but then the enemy goes on. Even if you have repented, he wants to accuse you of old sin that you actually repented of, and he condemns you about that. He tells you, hey, Oh, you want to worship God? You want to come into his presence now? Oh, you want to do quiet time? Do you remember what you did last week? Do you remember how you spoke to that colleague? How you treated your children or your spouse or your friend? And then if you have repented of that sin, he has no more legal right. Do you know what you do then? You take him by the hand almost and say, if you want to speak to somebody about my sin, speak to Jesus because he was nailed on the cross. He was paid for. Deal with him because he dealt with it. Do not let the accusation, the condemnation of the enemy keep you away from God's presence. Repent of your sin, turn away, and run to him. The other thing that might keep us away is fear. Fear, firstly, of facing ourselves. Maybe you are that person who are the overachiever, who just do so much in your life to almost drown out this this voice inside that is speaking to you and saying you're not good enough. You must do more. You're not performing well. And that is fear of facing yourself. Friends, you will never have peace if you're not willing to face yourself. And maybe there are a couple of things in your life that you've never dealt with. Then I encourage you to get into community, to start speaking to people, that they can walk with you through that, to disciple you through that. Maybe you need to go for counseling. Maybe it's undealt hurt 
or disappointments or, or pain from the past that you don't want to face in these moments of silence and solitude. Listen, no amount of work and effort and striving will ever give you peace. You have to become still, come into his presence so that he can heal you. The healing of the nations are in the leaves that is around this river. He has healing for you. Maybe you're fearing yourself, but sometimes I feared God. That's the other fear. And now there's a healthy fear of the Lord, a healthy respect and awe. But then this fear as twisted is one the way you always expect punishment. You expect that whenever you come into the presence of God or jump into this river, he's just going to reprimand you the whole time. Now, that's a wrong view of who God is. That's a view that God is this old man with this long beard and this stick in his hand or this thunderbolt or lightning bolt in his hand. No, that's Zeus. That's not God. Okay, (laughs) That's not who this amazing father is. Yes, there are moments by Spirit where He will convict us of sin in our lives. But the beautiful thing is He will always do it in a loving, kind way. It will be very direct and very specific. It won't be like a condemnation where it's like a blanket where everything is wrong with you. No, the Spirit shows you one thing, you repent. Shows you another thing, you repent. And it's a safe space. You do not have to fear Him. You can come into His presence because He is a good, good Father. The water of life flowing from the throne of God. I want to show you this picture. Imagine this is you. And I believe this is the invitation that God has for us to come and camp out at his river. (laughs) The proximity is you can jump in and out. You can wash. You can go out. You can enjoy. You can drink. It's close to stay close. And every day, this picture of, of camping next to his river. Now, um, a couple of um, holidays ago, we were in the Drakensberg, and this picture was taken of me in a river, in this little stream there, and it just me just bathing or enjoying the rush of the water and the freshness. And I believe that is what God has for you. Now, for some of us, um, this is the picture of my kids under the same little waterfall. That's Elizna feeling it, Vainan totally feeling it, and <laughs> little Carly not feeling it at all. Um, and, and maybe you are, you are used to, uh, feeling it and being in the presence of God and enjoying it and becoming still, become a habit for you. Proximity and frequency is a daily habit. Or maybe you're like little Carly, where it's might new for you and a little bit scary. That's okay. Take one step at a time to come into his presence, to come and drink from the water. He wants to speak to you because he wants relationship with you. He wants intimacy with you. First hand. Today is second hand. I'm delivering you. God is using me to speak to you today as well, I hope. But he wants first hand encounters with you because that is the God that he is. And that is what Jesus came to pay for so that you can have a first hand intimate relationship with him. In the beginning, I promised that we're going to do something practical. We're going to do it right now. And I trust by the Spirit of God that he will speak to you. I'm not going to help guide you through a scripture where I'm going to put it on the screen and you can uh, follow me as I direct you. It's going to be a bit of a moment of silence for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you, to quiet yourself, make sure there's no distractions around you. Quiet your soul. I'm going to pray for us now, and then I'm going to ask God to speak to you. So, Lord, I pray now through your Holy Scripture, would you speak to people right now? By faith I ask this, because your word is life-giving, and you want to speak to us. Speak into situations right now. So, here is the Scripture. Psalm 46, verse 10 to 11. I want you to read this through by yourself three times. Just read through it very slowly, three times.
He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I want you to read it out loud, even in a whisper. Just where you're sitting right now. Read it. Oh, well done. Now I want you to look at the scripture. What word or phrase, as you've read this now a couple of times, just pops out or stands out for you, just grabs your attention? I want you to look at that. Maybe it's be still. He's with us. Maybe it's know that I'm God. It might be some of the other ones as well. I want you to close your eyes where you're sitting. Because of that phrase that popped out, Ask God, Lord, what are you saying to me today about my life through that phrase that just popped out? Just take a moment and ask it. And ask him, how, Lord, should I respond to what you are saying to me right now? Ask him that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, through your gentle voice and through the power of your scripture. I trust that you've spoken to people right now. Give us the faith and the courage to respond, to obey, to actually listen. Not just hear you, but actually listen to you. Thank you that we can be still, that you want us in your presence. You made a way that we can live from your presence. And I pray that this river image will stick to us. Whenever we see a river again, will remind us of intimacy with you, proximity, frequency, so that we can become more and more like you. Spending time with you in your word, in prayer, hearing your voice and having you speak to us firsthand. And thank you that you made the first move showing that you desire a relationship with us. You sent your son to make a way. And by his blood alone, we can enter in and enjoy this beautiful river in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, thank you, Ritzy, for that truthful message that you just shared. I want to encourage you to stay in this moment as long as you need to or as long as possible. And remember, you can always come back and drink from that river. Remember, as always, if you enjoyed this moment, please share, hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you again next week.